front of us. That's a life of sin. We're going to be drawn to him. Do we really fear God? My hope and my prayer is that we do. We need to. The children of Israel in the Old Testament drifted away from God continuously over and over and over again. God would send a prophet. God would send a judge. There would be repentance. There would be returning to him. But they drifted away again. Do you fear God? I fear what God could do in our country if there's not a turning, returning to him by those of us who claim to be his children. There's another thing that we see in this passage of scripture that I think is a beautiful picture of what the lifestyle looks like. And that is that uh, it's a lifestyle that impacts how we view possessions. Look at verse 44 and 45. And those who had believed were together and they had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and we're sharing them with all as anyone might have a need. The world in which we live would have us to think that we need to accumulate things in our bank account so that when one of these days we retire, if we're able to retire, that we're able to afford to live. Just keep accumulating possessions over and over again. I may have shared this with you. Forgive me. I'm getting old, and sometimes I forget what I've shared. We sold every one of my mother's possessions a couple of weeks ago in a garage sale. It amounted to less than $1,300. 89 years that lady had acquired things, T-H-I-N-G-S. Now, my mother's a dear Christian. She loves the Lord. She's given a lot to the Lord through the years. But my point here is, that we work so hard to accumulate things that are so temporal, so temporal, can be taken away just like that. Some of you have experienced that. The lifestyle that's described in the book of Acts was one that... Uh, totally understood and underscored Christian stewardship. You see, everything Kent owns, including what I've got on this morning, belongs to him. All of it. Every bit of it does. Every penny in my bank account belongs to him. And if we're going to walk with him... In the spirit, we need to understand that someday he may touch us on the sleeve and say, I want you to share a part of what you got with somebody else. And he'll show us. I want you to share a portion of what you've got. It's mine anyway, God would say, right? He has a right to say that. Share it with others. It's not yours. Because at the end of life, if you're lucky, you may have less than $2,000 worth of stuff that somebody else, the next generation, can sell off for you. It impacted how they were living. They shared. Those with much shared with others. They were all able to eat, even in a tough economy. I mean, as you study the history of this day and time when this was written, the Romans were tough. They were taskmasters. They ruled. You read through the scriptures, and sometimes you get the idea that the scribes and Pharisees ruled. They didn't rule. The Romans ruled. They ruled over them. They ruled over everybody. It was not easy to make a living in that day and time. The taxes were high, my friends. Sound familiar? Taxes were high. One of Jesus' early followers was a tax gatherer, Matthew. Tax collectors. The Jews hated the tax collectors. They represented the Romans. It impacts how we view our possessions. When it's a lifestyle. 
If it's just something that I get up on Sunday morning and I put on my white shirt and my coat, that's not a lifestyle, is it? That's a show. This is not who I am. This is just clothes that I put on, right? A lifestyle is how I live. And it was greatly impacted by Jesus Christ. It's a lifestyle also that controls our focus. Look at the very next verse. And day by day, they were continuing with one mind in the temple. There's unity there, one mind, right? <clears throat> that didn't mean that they were all at the same stage of spiritual maturity. That's not what that meant. It meant that they were together in their purpose and in their focus. They knew that they weren't living for themselves. They were living for Jesus. They knew that everything they would do would be a reflection on Him. And unity and togetherness, a common focus, was what they shared. They were of one mind. That didn't mean that they never disagreed. That's not what that meant. It meant that when it came to their purpose of existence as a body of believers in Jesus Christ, they were together. I'll never forget, I was in church one time, large church. And uh, there was a division about a particular issue that came up in, in before the church. And one person came to me and he said, you know, Pastor, he said, uh, you know, there's just some folks that's for it and some folks against it. He said, I guess the spirits with some folks leading them one way, the spirits with another group leading them a different way. I said, no way. God's spirit's not divided. Point is, you haven't sought the spirit's leadership. When you seek his leadership, there's a oneness of mind having to do with the purpose of why the church exists and what she's all about in the world. It was true in this church, the church at Jerusalem, the early church. It should be true with us today. A oneness of mind because there's a oneness of spirit, his spirit. When there's still division on a major issue, folks, we just need to get on our knees and spend more time Searching for God's truth, his revelation in that matter. I don't know how many of you have ever been through uh, experiencing God with Henry Blackaby. Several of you, I think, uh, had been at one time or another. It's a great study. It's about a man who took a small church uh, in Canada and took some basic principles that God had been teaching him through the years and he began to apply those principles and God began to bless that church and they grew and they grew and they grew and they grew. And they grew. And not only that, they started all kinds of other churches. They started new works all over that section of Canada. There was a oneness of mind, Henry said, among the people in that church. And God blessed it. They didn't always agree on everything, but they sought the Spirit's leadership until they were together. It's a lifestyle also, according to God's word, in verse 47, that reflects praise of God. You know, I love it when we stand up early and worship, even if it's uh, when the machine, machinery doesn't work right, Kenny. <laughs> Whatever. That's great praise. Great praise to our God. This kind of lifestyle leads to that kind of praise. There was a continual praise of God day in and day out in the life of that early church. They went about not just singing praise to him, but uh, certainly they probably did. Now, you would be um, probably frown on me if I was out here on the street singing because I don't sing very well. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I did all the way over this morning? Because I had a short night, too. I played praise music. On the, on, the, on the CD, in my car. I wanted to praise God. Praising Him all the time. 